Hello again. Um, today we're going to talk about elliptic curves or the complex numbers. Uh, before we've started with generalities about elliptic curves or fields, then we've done just a very quick uh, uh, detour over finite fields. Let me talk just again very briefly about elliptic curves over the complex numbers. Some of these proofs uh, that I'm going to talk about are in Silverman in this first book of Silverman. Some of the proofs are not even in this book. They are in the second part of the book. Um, and um, so in, in any case, I just want to give you some, um, some basics of elliptic curves over the complex numbers uh, before we move on to, uh, to finite, to local fields. Okay, so uh, the goal is the following theorem. The goal of what I want to talk about is just describe all the elements of this theorem. Uh, so it turns out that if you have an elliptic curve defined over the complex numbers, okay, so just like before, but now the model is defined over the complex, uh, it turns out that then uh, there exists a lattice uh, lambda in the complex numbers. I'll describe what a lattice is in a moment, uh, which is unique up to uh, homotopy. Uh, that just means uh, scaling. Okay, homotopy just means that I can scale it, uh, scale the entire lattice. Again, we'll we'll see what that means. And uh, a complex analytic uh, isomorphism uh, phi from uh, that quotient, so the lattice is a subgroup, is an additive subgroup of the complex number. So if you do the quotient of the complex by the lattice, you get uh, another structure. And uh, it goes to the points on the elliptic curve over the complex numbers. Uh, this is an, uh, an isomorphism of complex uh, Lie groups. A Lie group, if you don't know, uh, that is. Uh, a group that is also a differentiable uh, manifold. Okay, so it's given by equations that are uh, differentiable, and the addition, the operation is also uh, some different differential, uh, differentiable operation. Okay, so um, what does this mean? Uh, let, let's first, uh, so what this means is the following is that, um, so if I have an elliptic curve, uh, let's say uh, I have my elliptic curve y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, uh, with here a and b now are complex numbers, we still have that 4a cubed plus 27b squared is non zero, uh, so it is a um, a smooth elliptic curve. And then you can talk about the points. There's still a group structure of, ellip on, of the elliptic curve. So points on E such that X and Y are complex. And there's still only one point uh, at infinity, which is the point at infinity. Okay, so it turns out that there's going to be an isomorphism between this with the group structure of addition on the elliptic curve and the following. So a lattice is uh, a two dimensional abelian uh, group, uh, additive group inside the complex numbers uh, with the same addition as in the complex numbers. So it has zero is in the group. And then um, what it just means is that it's a to be an additive subgroup. Uh, so it's an, a subgroup that when you uh, tensor with R, you get all of the complex numbers. So if you take any two vectors in the complex numbers, 
like this, then take the subgroup that is generated by these two vectors over the integers, so additively, then um, I have a little ruler here to help me. Um, let me Let's extend that guy like this and like that. Like that. And then uh, let's extend this vector here. Uh, that's not going to work. Like this. And then um, it also extends here. And, and so on and so forth. Okay, so more or less like that, it doesn't look great, but all the points that you see are the multiples that you can get by adding uh, what I'm going to call W1 and uh, omega1 and omega2. Okay. Uh, if you do uh, integer multiples and add all the points, then what you get is these points. So this is a lattice. Okay. And in green are the points that belong to the lattice. And then uh, when I do the quotient of the complex by the lattice, what it means is that now I'm looking at numbers modulo the lattice. So a point, say here, I can add. Uh, w2 and you see that these two points are congruent and if I do uh, omega 1 add omega 1 these two points are congruent and so on so every point now every point that I pick if I pick this point here that point will be congruent to this point but also be congruent to this one what it means is that every point has a congruent point in what I'm going to call the fundamental domain uh, which is given by uh, this region. With this region that includes uh, zero, it includes this point and it includes, uh, uh, no, no, it doesn't include this point. Whoa. It's, uh, so with these uh, removed, so it includes all these points, it doesn't include the, the ones up there. Uh, and then it doesn't include those. That would be a fundamental domain. Every point in the complex plane has a point that is congruent to it inside this fundamental domain. So basically what you get is a flat torus. Okay, so this, uh, because now this side identifies with this side and uh, this side identifies with this side, what you get is that the, co the quotient of the complex by the lattice is isomorphic to this, which is in turn isomorphic to uh, uh, complex torus. Okay. But uh, a complex flat torus. Um, so it's one of these sort of like uh, a video game screen where if you go through one side, you enter from the other side. All right, very good. So uh, what this is saying is that typical picture when people say it's a, it's a donut or a torus, this is where this comes from, that there is an isomorphism between the points uh, that goes from here to uh, the points that are in there. All right, uh, the addition on, on the complex modulo the lattice is really easy. Uh, so I can actually deduce quite a bit of things about my elliptic curve structure from that, from this isomorphism. Right. So what I want to do is actually um, um, work this out, just to give you more details about how this theorem actually works. Um, let's start with some definitions. A lot of Lambda is a discrete additive 
uh, subgroup of uh, the complex uh, numbers and their addition, um, which uh, contains an R basis of uh, the complex numbers. For example, uh, the simplest uh, example is Z adjoint I. Right, this corresponds to the lattice, which is simply uh, the square lattice uh, that you get uh, where the vectors here are one and I. Okay, uh, so uh, that is the square lattice. And uh, what we will see is that um, the elliptic curve that you get when you do uh, the, uh, the lattice Z adjoint I, it's isomorphic to an elliptic curve or the complex numbers. And it turns out that it's just the elliptic curve Y squared equals X cubed minus X um, over the complex numbers. There is isomorphic to this one, okay? Um, very good. You can also do, um, by the way, it's interesting that in here, now I have, uh, we, I think we might have mentioned this before, that we saw that this has extra endomorphisms. Uh, it's not completely clear at first, but it, it, this elliptic curve has an extra endomorphism that says since x y two uh, minus x comma i y. All right, uh, it has this extra endomorphism, and um, it is uh, well. The, if you stare at it, you might find it. We called it i, and uh, it has a very clear explanation of what happens here. This extra endomorphism corresponds simply to the endomorphism of these flat torus that sends z to i times z. It turns out that that preserves the lattice. Uh, so uh, notice that i times zi is still the same lattice. So the map is well-defined modulo the lattice. And um, so, so yeah, in this actually I should have written, this is z mod zi is sent to iz modulo zi. And uh, you can check that it's well-defined because the lattice is preserved by multiplication by i. So it's very clear to see that there is an endomorphism there on the, um, on the lattice side. And then you can figure out what's the endomorphism on the other side. Um, there is other lattices one can pick. Another lattice that is going to appear in a moment is z adjoint row. Uh, what's rho here? It's a third root of unity. So I'm going to pick, I'm going to try to draw a circle right here. Um, let's, see, let's see how it comes out. Okay. And then I can uh, divide the circle in three identical parts. I'm cutting the circle in three parts, which is cyclotomic means. Um, and then I'm going to pick my vectors to be, this is going to be one vector. I'm going to call the row because uh, this point here is row, my third root of unity. And uh, my other uh, vector is going to be one. And with that lattice, I get a lattice. It's going to look like um, something like this. Um, so it's going to look like Uh, like this lattice, and uh, and now I want to know the lattice is actually the points at the intersections, and what we are going to uh, uh, to see in a moment is that if I look at this elliptic curve, it turns out that is going to be uh, an elliptic curve given by um, 
y squared equals x cubed plus one, for example. Okay. Uh, it is also true on this side, now that we know how to uh, look for endomorphisms on the lattice side, it turns out that it's easy to see that um, rho times zero is still the same lattice. Okay, it's preserved. When I pick uh, judiciously, when I pick my uh, vector elements to be some algebraic number with a certain property, then those are going to be preserving the lattice when I multiply by itself. Okay, so this third of unity, third root of unity, when I multiply the lattice for that, I get still the same lattice. And that gives me, um, it gives me an endomorphism um, to itself that sends Z modulo uh, the lattice to a uh, row times Z uh, modulo the lattice. And now um, what is that endomorphism on the other side? Uh, well, uh, it has to do with something with uh, roots of unity. I can send uh, X, Y to, um, uh, well, I, I can just send X to row X. Right, because um, rho cube is going to be uh, one, so I get the same that that's also a point. Okay, so that endomorphism gives me a way to um, uh, it, it gives me uh, an endomorphism of the elliptic curve that I didn't know before. Okay. So um, it's useful to know both uh, incarnations of elliptic curves, just algebraically, but also as a complex in this complex analytic isomorphism uh, gives me also some information. All right, so how is this yeah, isomorphism yeah, going to be defined? Yes, good I question. Sorry, thank you. Um, what is, so it, I think the two examples that we've given here, um, am I correct that this shows that both of these have complex multiplication? Correct, correct. Remember that uh, complex multiplication, uh, so an elliptic curve has complex multiplication if the endomorphism ring, mm -hmm. uh, we always know that we have the integers in there, meaning, uh, meaning multiplication by n maps. Uh, but if the endomorphism ring it is contained but not equal, so there is additional endomorphisms, uh, uh, yeah, that's that's the definition. If there are extra endomorphisms, and we say that it has complex multiplication, uh, okay. this is not. Uh, this one is not multiplication by n uh, for an integer n, and this is not multiplication by n uh, for an integer n. So these are uh, new endomorphisms that we didn't account for. So both elliptic curves has complex multiplication. Okay. What would the exam what what would an example of a lattice be where you have a curve without complex multiplication, where the endomorphisms are just multiplication by integers? Um sure. I don't have one right here, but um uh this in fact basically any other lattice we pick is going to have that property. Um uh, ba basically, lattices that give you elliptic curves that are defined over the, over Q and um, and that they have these properties. There is essentially, I believe, there's only like up to isomorphism. There's only thirteen types of lattices that give you that. So almost all uh, lattices are going to give you uh, something that does not have complex multiplication. So if you pick instead of row, pick a tau, which is a complex number at random, basically. Um, almost surely you're going to get a ladder that does not have complex multiplication. The fact that okay. this is satisfied, the fact that uh, this is satisfied and mm -hmm. this is satisfied, if you um, if you um, if you see what that means, for example, it tells you that row. I mean, if if you if you had anything like this, for example, if uh, if tau times z adjoint tau is z adjoint tau, then in particular, 
tau uh, tau square is on the left hand side, so it has to be some uh, a plus b tau, right? So right in, right there, it already tells you that tau has to be a quadratic algebraic integer, which so just pick tau to be a cubic algebraic integer. Already that tells you that this cannot happen for a cubic algebraic integer. Or take tau to be uh, any uh, anything that is not algebraic. So take tau to be uh, pi, a uh, pi i, for example. Already that's going to throw everything off, and this is going to give a completely different lattice that does not have complex multiplication. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. So, Thank you. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, so that happens. So this happens often um, that it happens often that this doesn't happen. <laughs> that there is no complex multiplication. Okay, so, so complex multiplication, you should think about it as a, a rare occurrence. It's, um, they're nice to pick, for example, because you can do extra things with them and show some features of the complex analytic map. But in general, there is no such, um, uh, no complex multiplication. Okay, so now what is the this isomorphism, this analytic isomorphism going to be like? It's going to involve what we call uh, elliptic functions. So elliptic functions is simply, we've talked about this before, I just defined something new for you, which is a lattice and then the quotient of a lattice of the complex plane by a lattice. That is what's actually called a Riemann surface. Uh, and then um, I want to know what are the functions on this surface? What are the functions on this new object? So, um, so the functions are called elliptic functions. So an elliptic function uh, relative to a lattice uh, lambda is a meromorphic function um, f on that takes values on the complex numbers such that f of z plus w equals f of z for all uh, complex numbers and all uh, omegas or w's in lambda. Okay, uh, so in particular, f induces a function on z mod lambda. Okay, because it's zero or it's invariant under. Uh, addition. So, what this is saying that if z and z plus w are in the same class modulo lambda, then they have the same value. So, you can do this about a function on z mod lambda. Uh, the set of all such functions uh, is denoted by uh, z lambda. Okay. Uh, notice that I've actually uh, requested meromorphic, and you might say, like, well, I mean, aren't we talking about some uh, analytic isomorphism? Don't you want these to be uh, analytic functions? And you do not uh, because that's too strong. Uh, an elliptic function. with uh, no zeros or poles in the uh, complex numbers is constant. Uh, why is that? If you um, if you uh, if you've seen some complex analysis, then you know that uh, if no zeros or poles, then that would say that it's bounded on a fundamental parallelogram 
parallelogram. Um, I think I'm off with my else. Uh, so it's bounded on the fundamental domain, right? But then um, it's the same value all over the complex plane because the value at any point, I can bring it back to a value in the fundamental domain. Um, so this tells you that all of the function uh, is bounded in absolute value. And then uh, what's called uh, Liouville, Liouville's theorem. Liouville, oh, I have spelling today, it's off. Uh, oh, yeah. Liouville theorem, which tells you that a bounded entire function is constant, uh, that would tell you that F is constant. Let's see. All right. So um, we need that meromorphic part to it. So here, here are some examples of um, of uh, of elliptic functions. Here is the most important example: is the Weierstrass p function. So the Weierstrass stress p function, oops, not row, uh, this is a p, it is called Weierstrass stress p in LaTeX, there is even a symbol for it. If you do slash wp, that's uh, the Weierstrass stress p. Uh, that's uh, a function of a complex variable and it takes uh, lambda as an input is defined by uh, one over z squared plus uh, the sum over omegas in the lattice uh, with omega non-zero of one minus one over z minus w squared minus one over omega squared. You see that there is a lot of poles. There is a pole for every point in the lattice, actually. Okay, so there's no poles in the interior of the parallelogram of the fundamental domain, but there's poles everywhere else. And uh, this function, I'm not going to show it. Um, if you are good at your complex analysis, you can check that it converges uh, uniformly on uh, compact sets, compact uh, subsets of uh, Z minus lambda. And uh, it is meromorphic um, on the complex numbers uh, with uh, double poles, not just a pole, but double poles at each element of the lattice. Okay, so that is an example of a function. You can see. Um, that it's actually invariant under translation uh, by uh, an element of the lattice, sort of by the construction of it. All right, uh, so that is going to be very important. If, in the absence of a lambda, you have to assume what lambda we're talking about. Sometimes we'll just write a P of Z uh, if there is only one, um, one lattice floating around. Okay, so here is another example. Another important example are the Eisenstein series. Of weight. 2k are defined by their G 2k of a lattice. Um, this is just the sum over. These are some, uh, they are, you see, there is no dependence of a value Z. These are actually aux auxiliary that are going to come in actually in the expansions of the via stress uh, P function. 
Um, but let's just define it. So it's the sum of uh, one over omega to the two k over omegas in the lattice except for zero. This act is absolute absolutely convergent. Uh, for k bigger than one, and uh, one something to note here is that if I scale the uh, the lattice, these changes the value changes, but changes by a known uh, way. So if I scale my lattice, by that I mean just you have two vectors that span your lattice, and then multiply both by the same vector. That is a homotopy. Uh, that is, uh, well, just what is is going to be the vectors in the new lattice are going to be um, actually parameterized also by vectors from the previous lattice, but now evaluate at alpha omega to the two k. So that is one over alpha to the two k times the previous sum. Uh, which is just uh, one alpha to the 2k g 2k of the previous lattice. We're going to use this property in a moment. Okay. Um, so uh, if you want uh, g 2k of lambda is also alpha to the 2k g 2k of alpha uh, lambda. Okay, so they have that property. That property, by the way, the fact that uh, when you scale a factor of alpha to the minus 2k comes out, that is uh, what this terminology means, the weight uh, 2k. All right, so now uh, the theorem, which I'm not going to prove, one of the many theorems here I'm not going to prove, is that um, we can find out all the elliptic functions uh, for a given elliptic curve and a, for a given lattice, if lambda is a lattice, then remember this was the field of meromorphic functions. The field of meromorphic functions is in fact generated by two uh, two uh, elliptic functions. The via stress p function and the derivative of the via stress p function, which turns out to also be an elliptic function. So every elliptic function can be constructed as a product of these uh, some algebraic uh, construction on the via stress p and the via stress, uh, the, the derivative of the via stress p. All right. And then um, uh, maybe. I'll do this in the next slide. Uh, two parts here. Uh, the Laurent series for the via stress p function about z equals zero. Is remember that the Laurent series is an extension of the Taylor series, but that allows for uh, negative powers. Is uh, z to the minus two plus the sum from k one up to infinity, and the coefficients turn out to be uh, Eisenstein series. Okay, so it has that expansion. And B, more importantly, uh, what we care about is the following, that for all complex values uh, that are not in the lattice, uh, we have the following differential equation, a differential equation between via stress uh, functions, which is the following, uh, the derivative of the via stress equation of the via stress function is squared is equal to uh, four uh, the cube of the via stress minus sixty g four lambda 
uh, Viastras minus 140 G6 lambda. Okay, so this is a Viastras equation. Um, this is a Viastras equation. If you put the, uh, instead of Viastras function, you put an X, and instead of Viastras prime, you put a Y, then you see that you get um, this resembles, this is precisely y squared equals x cubed or 4x cubed uh, plus ax plus b. Okay, so they, it's telling you that um, the Weierstrass function and the Weierstrass p function, the derivative, satisfy what we call a short Weierstrass equation with that 4 in, in front, which if you remember way back when we defined the b coefficients, that 4 was there. Uh, for this reason. Um, by the way, so this is uh, historically, this is how elliptic curves came to be. We, Weierstrass was studying uh, functions of this sort, elliptic functions, and then he discovered that uh, what is now named after him, the Weierstrass p function, the Weierstrass, the derivative of the Weierstrass p function, the satisfied this relation, and then you can give to these Riemann surfaces, the quotients of the complex by the um, by the lattice, you can give them an algebraic structure, which is very explicit, and you can construct exactly the algebraic uh, model for them. So this is actually how they came to be. If you go to the website for the class, there is some um, there is some um, links to some papers that actually talk about the lip, the history of elliptic curves, and they actually historically this is how you should think about how uh, elliptic curves came about. And in fact, this elliptic, uh, the word elliptic comes not because the curves are elliptic, uh, they're ellipses, they're not ellipses, but it comes because of um, these functions also have relations to. Um, to integrals of like the arc length in ellipses, okay? But in any case, there are some uh, history um, papers that are really interesting if you're into that sort of thing. All right, so um, now what we're going to do is I'm going to set, because of, you see the, how these appear here, we're gonna give those uh, two new names. G2 is uh, G2 of a lattice, is going to be uh, 60 times G4, capital G4, and uh, G3 is going to be, uh, G3 of a lattice is going to be 140 uh, G6, capital uh, G6. And uh, the result now is that, um, so now let, let's use that uh, Weierstrass form that came out of nowhere. Uh, so let lambda be a lattice uh, with uh, G2 and G3 as above. And, uh, and let E, now an elliptic curve, be the curve defined by Y squared equals 4X cubed minus G2X minus G3. Okay, the algebraic elliptic curve given by that form. Then, uh, this is an elliptic curve. So what that needs to prove there is that it is uh, non-singular. Um, and uh, the map that sends, that goes from the lattice to E, that sends Z or a class of uh, Z to P, P prime one is an isomorphism of complex Lie groups. Um, so what this means uh, is that it is an isomorphism of Riemann surfaces uh, which is a group homomorphism 
also a group homomorphism. Okay, so there we have um, uh, the isomorphism coming about. So if I have a lattice, I can give you what elliptic curve will correspond to this lattice via these values, G2 of lambda and G3 of lambda, I'm going to get an elliptic curve. By the way, I can, um, if you are bothered by these four, I can change Y by two Y and then divide by four throughout and see that this is isomorphic over Q over the base field, uh, whatever the base field is for G2 and G3, uh, this is isomorphic to uh, these other uh, elliptic curve, okay? Which is in in short value stretch form, like we've talked about before. Why the square equals x plus a x plus b. All right, great. So uh, here is the isomorphism, and the isomorphism from a lattice to E is actually given by uh, the value stress p function and its derivative. All right. Um, then you need to know. Well, when can I have two uh, complex tori be the same? And it turns out that complex tori are isomorphic if and only if the lattices are homothetic. Okay, so uh, fact. If you have an isomorphism of groups like this, um, then there is an, uh, a homothetic that gives you uh, one goes to the other. And what that gives you is a corollary, which is that uh, let E1 and E2 uh, be elliptic curves over the complex numbers. Um, which correspond to lattices lambda one and lambda two respectively, then E1 are is isomorphic to E2 over the complex numbers if and only if uh, lambda one and lambda two are homothetic. Okay, so that gives you a classification of um, of of lattices. Um, you can, in fact, uh, go even farther. I can always, if I have a then any lattice, I can fix. I can, um, if you have the two vectors of the lattice, I can divide. I can scale it by the first vector so that every vector every lattice is given by a vector one and something else. So you can actually define every lattice as a span by one and a tau, a tau in the complex plane. Okay, I'm not gonna get into that. That would give, lead me a little bit of afar, but uh, now what we get is to what we call the uniformization theorem, which is what we were, after and it's the following um so it's the other direction of the one we've seen which is uh, so let a and b be complex numbers uh such that uh, a cubed minus 27 b squared is non-zero then there is a unique lattice lambda in the complex numbers um, such that G2 lambda is A and G3 lambda is B, okay? So uh, that will give you um, that isomorphism that we want with 
e given by y square equals 4x cubed minus g2x minus g3. Okay, so the previous theorem told you uh, given a lattice, I can find the elliptic curve that is isomorphic to the flat torus. And this goes the other way. Given an elliptic curve that is algebraic, there is a unique lattice that gives me that isomorphism. Okay, uh, how does this direction work? Uh, I'm just only going to give you some uh, very sketchy details. So if I have an elliptic curve, how do I find out what is my lattice? That is um, the hard part. Once I know the lattice, I can go in the other direction uh, just easily using the G2 and G3 functions. Um, so what happens is that I, I need some I need some vectors that are going to give me the lattice. And what happens is that you look at, um, if you look at this as a Riemann surface, then it does look like a torus like this, okay? If you remember actually the, the real image that we have in, in our heads of an elliptic curve, an elliptic curve usually looks like this, right? And what you should think about uh, about this is that that is the that is one slice of the uh, of the picture. So I've 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 taken out sort of like a an X ray, and here is one of the bubbles, and here is the other bubble that appear in this picture. So if you look at it like this, or the complex numbers, this is how I think about elliptic curves. And this what happens is that there should be another point that it's not here. Is at infinity. So it looks like this. So it sort of like looks like a donut that's been uh, squished in in one of the directions. Um, it's been deformed, but it's sort of like that picture. Okay. So, but in any case, I have my torus, and then what I need is to come up with some integrals that are going to give me um, uh, what I want. So it turns out that there's two different integrals I can do two different path integrals, I can uh, look at these type of paths that go around in that direction. Maybe I should um, do it like this and then like this, or I can do a path that goes in this direction. Those two paths, if you are uh, familiar in, uh, with topology, those are not, uh, they cannot be deformed to the same path. And uh, what we do is look at homology. So if you compute the homology H1 of E with uh, integer coefficients, what this is are, uh, these are paths. So what I need is paths alpha and beta that uh, generate um, the homology, and then I can take my lattice to be omega one, which is the integral of in that path alpha of my invariant differential and the integral along the path beta of my invariant differential. And it turns out that those two vectors, um, those two complex numbers, are the two complex numbers that will generate the lattice that I need um, to prove the uniformization theorem. Okay, There's a lot to prove there that I'm not doing, um, but um, let's leave it at that. Okay, two two things that come out of this. So some consequences here. Um, let me just. Um, show that, um, remember, recall, we have seen algebraically that the m torsion of an elliptic curve is isomorphic to z mod mz plus z mod mz when the elliptic curve is defined over k with k of characteristic zero. Okay, we used quite a bit of machinery of iso isogenies and degrees of the isogenies to prove this. Over the complex numbers, 
So, um, so we saw that alternatively, we can now use what we know over uh, the complex numbers, because if K is a field of characteristic zero, then I can actually uh, embed K in the complex numbers. Okay, and um, and then what is the M torsion? The M torsion is uh, well. Let's see. What are the points over? Uh, that's awful. Writing right there over the complex numbers. What is the M torsion? Well, I know what the complex uh, structure is. The complex structure, if there is some lattice, so now I want to know what is the M torsion of the lattice. Um, if you draw the lattice, this is actually not hard to visualize now what it should be. There is a vector and there is another vector. So the lattice or the fundamental domain looks like this, right? And then, for example, the point of order two, or let's say the point of order three. Uh, so here is a point of order three that's just zero. Those are point of order one. The points of actual order three are points that three times that vector gives me zero. So, for example, uh, if you divide this in three identical parts, these points are point of order three. These points are point of order three. And then if you translate them, like this, those points will be points of order three. Those are nine points, and those are actually all the points of order three that can happen um, for the elliptic curve. Uh, you can now see that algebraically or uh, with algebra, because now what is the M torsion? The M torsion uh, is isomorphic to uh, the structure modulo uh, modulo M and uh, this is isomorphic to the lattice itself modulo uh, M times the lattice and this will be isomorphic to the lattice is just two copies of uh, the integer so this is sort of like I just isomorphic to Z mod Z modulo M Z mod Z as a billing groups and this is just isomorphic to Z mod MZ uh, plus Z mod MZ. Okay, so that's where it comes from that um, the torsion will have that many points on exactly that as uh, algebraic structure. Okay. Let me, I have only like one minute, but I, I wanna go back to those lattices we discussed with complex multiplication uh, and I gave you what the um, the elliptic curve was for the lattice, but let me go back to that. So remember, I had the lattice z adjoint i, and I want to know what elliptic curve corresponds to this lattice. Um, I said already I spoiled the 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 elliptic curve that is going to be it, um, but let's use the properties of the lattice. So what I know is that I times the lattice is the lattice itself. And that allows me to uh, prove the following. Uh, how much is G3 of the lattice? Well, G3 of the lattice is the same that I times the lattice evaluated at G3. And now remember that G3, little g3, in fact, so uh, capital G3 was of weight uh, 2k, so weight 6. The little g was just a constant times that, so this is of weight 6, so the i can come out to the minus 6 power. If This example actually I took from Silverman's uh, advanced topics on elliptic curves, the second volume. And there's a typo here, instead of minus 6, it says 6. It doesn't matter because I to the minus six equals I to the six, but it will matter in a moment. Um, so this I to the six is I to the square is minus one to the three is minus one still. Uh, so this is minus G three 
lambda. G3 lambda is a complex number such that itself equals minus itself is going to be zero. Okay, here, by the way, here again, I use the fact that uh, G2K alpha lambda is alpha to the minus 2K G2K of lambda. Okay, but this implies that G3 of lambda is zero. And therefore, um, my elliptic curve is going to be y squared equals 4x cubed minus g2 lambda, whatever that is, x, okay? Which is isomorphic to uh, an elliptic curve of the form y squared equals x cubed minus g2 lambda uh, divided by 4x. Um, and over the complex numbers, actually, all of these are isomorphic all of these with regardless of what coefficient a you put there over the complex number they're all isomorphic so if you remember the changes of variables you can actually change variables over the complex numbers to be isomorphic to any of them so this is isomorphic to this elliptic curve which is an elliptic curve with j equals 1728 all of them in this family have the same j invariant so they're isomorphic over the complex numbers by the way amazingly um, um, Hurwitz uh, determined what that G2 lambda is in this case, G2 of the uh, of the Gaussian of the uh, of the of ZI is um, 64 times 0, 1 DT over the square root of fourth power. So you can actually compute that if you want using that integral. Right. Um, and then let me go back to quickly to the lattice that we had, the other lattice with Z adjoined row. Uh, we also have the row times the lattice is the lattice. Now rho is a third root of unity. And this implies that G2 of lambda is G2 of Rho lambda is rho to the minus, uh, in this case, is 2k, so to the minus 4. Um, G2 of lambda, um, which is uh, rho squared G2 lambda, which is non zero, um, so, and it's not equal to 1. So if this equals that, then we must have the G2 lambda in this case is zero. And this tells you through the uniformization theorem that the elliptic curve that corresponds to it is uh, 4x cubed minus g3 lambda, uh, which in this case, this is isomorphic to y squared equals x cubed plus 1 over the complex numbers, okay? Over the complex numbers, uh, these are isomorphic. And these are elliptic curves with uh, j equals 0. All right, so that's how uh, algebraically you can, uh, using the properties of the Eisenstein function, uh, Eisenstein series, you can actually determine in some cases what is the value stress model that corresponds to a lattice itself. Okay, so I'm over time, sorry, and um, I'll, I'll continue next time. Uh, now go back to uh, the chapter on formal groups. All right, I'm going to stop there. Thank you.